All right. Um, <coughs> so uh, le let me remind you of where we were. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in my previous lecture, I had been speaking to you about uh, the company and its expansion, and we had gotten to around the 1730s, 1740s. Um, and I want to tell you very briefly what the agenda is for today and uh, for Thursday, so that you can prepare. Uh, so today we're going to go up to the 1760s, 1770s, which includes the conquest, as it's called, the conquest of Bengal, uh, whereby the company is going to be transformed into the rulers of India. Um, we're going to try to consider some aspects of that history, uh, including some aspects of the economic and social history of India uh, in the 1740s, 1750s, moving into the 1760s and 70s. Uh, then in my lecture on Thursday, I'm going to describe to you uh, exactly what the consolidation of British rule in India entailed. How did the British consolidate their rule? What were the mechanisms of uh, administration, what were, what is some of the political history of India at that point in time. Uh, and I'm going to continue with some of my comments on the social history of India. Uh, uh, and when I say social history of India here, what I'm really referring to in particular uh, is the nature of interactions between the Indians uh, and the English. Uh, and you have a reading for this week. I want to say a few words about that reading as well. This is a book by William Dalrymple. You're reading about 70 odd pages from it called White Muggles. Uh, the, the title itself is an arresting one, should give you some clues about how to approach the book. Uh, because the argument that Dalrymple is going to make, I'm going to look at it in some detail, uh, is that uh, there was a kind of a multiculturalism uh, in India uh, in the early years of the British. Uh, that certainly, certainly in the 1600s, uh, the bulk of the book, uh, you're not reading the entire book, the book is uh, 500 odd pages, uh, but the bulk of the book is actually about the late uh, uh, 1700s. Um, but uh, the, the first 30, 40 pages, which is what I want you to read most attentively, I mean, I assigned, I think, about 60, 70 pages, but if you read the first 30, 30 40 pages, uh, that would really suffice because what he's trying to suggest is that uh, there is a different way to write uh, the history of the British uh, in India, that it's not simply a story of conquest of doom and gloom, uh, that there was some degree of social interaction, uh, that the English, in fact, like all other Europeans who had come to India before them, in some ways Indianized themselves. Um, now, I am somewhat sympathetic to that argument, but we're going to try to consider the complexities of it, uh, certainly not today, but on Thursday. So, but I want you to th start thinking about uh, what he means when he makes claims such as the fact that the Europeans, particularly the English, were able to Indianize themselves. And then sometime around the late 1700s, early 1800s, it began to change. Uh, a racial, the racial element became predominant. Uh, the question is, why did the racial element become predominant? at that point in time? Is it because, for example, the British had now become the rulers before they were not the rulers? So when they were the rulers, did they become arrogant? Uh, there is very often a common, uh, a common argument that is put forward, uh, and that is that in the early years, certainly until I would say about the late 1700s, uh, when we speak about the British in India, we're speaking about predominantly men predominantly men. Uh, it was single men who came over. They hardly ever brought their families over. Now, if they're single British men in India, you can imagine that they're probably consorted with Indian women. They had sexual relations with Indian women. They had Indian concubines, some of them, right? Uh, so now think about the implications of that. Is it the case that the coming of English women changed relations between? the Indians and the British. This is very often the argument. Uh, and I've got some un amount of unease with that argument because once again, the onus is on women. Uh, you know, everything was hunky-dory between the Indian men, b between Indian women and English men. Well, you yeah, they were having nice relations with each other and then these English women come and, uh, you know, now they want to domesticate their men and say, hey, you can't be mixing around with Indian women, you know. You know, your morals are gonna get corrupted. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? You see, the, we'll have to think about these things. That's what I mean when I say the social history. Um, and I think the Dalrymple book is important because it, 
at least opens up these questions for reflection, even if one doesn't always agree with his highly optimistic account of the multiculturalism that prevailed uh, between the Indians and the Britishers in the late 17th century. But that's, that's in part what I mean by the social history. Uh, and, and so here I'm also giving you a little cue about how to read the texts, because sometimes you'll find that the text is very long, but you know, you want to try to get to the essence uh, of the argument, all right? Now let's return to our narrative. Uh, 1730s, 1740s. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, and I've mentioned this before in passing, I want to reiterate it now and, and move it in slightly different directions as well. I mentioned to you that India was in many ways the textile capital of the world. Uh, there was a great demand for all kinds of Indian textiles in Europe. Uh, these included silks, uh, cottons, muslins, embroidered quilts. Uh, I mentioned to you muslin. Muslin is uh, a, a very finely woven, you know, yards of it you could slip through a ring finger, okay? There is a story that is told. It might be apocryphal. I don't care if it's actually apocryphal, if it's true or not, but it's a widely circulated story that the, that the daughter of the emperor Aurangzeb once appeared before him and he became enraged because he said you can't appear before your father nude. Well she wasn't nude. She was draped in several, seven layers of muslin. But the cloth is so thin that it looked like she was nude. Right? right? So this is, this is what we're really talking about here. That there was an extraordinary demand for these textiles and in fact uh, by the late 1600s, Britain was imposing very heavy import duties uh, on this, on, on textiles coming from India, calicos, cotton coming into, coming into Britain uh, because of, of course, protectionism, right? Uh, but notwithstanding that, the, the craving for these continued. Uh, and it was not simply in England, it was all throughout Europe. Uh, and in fact, in about 1697 or thereabouts, uh, English weavers, dyers, linen drapers, they actually attacked uh, the company's headquarters in London because they were so enraged because they were saying that, you know, we're losing our business and, and England needs to be much more protectionist, that our own industries, textile industries are actually being damaged. And, and what the company would very often do is they would actually re-export these Indian textiles that came, okay, from India to Britain. They, the Brit, then the company would actually re-export re them within Europe from Britain itself. Um, but this demand, I've said, continued to be very high and in fact remained, these textiles remained immensely popular throughout the 18th century. Now, uh, we have to bring in a new element when we're looking at this textile trade, and that is the triangular trade, uh, which again I have mentioned in passing, we're gonna talk about a little bit more now again, and then we're gonna return to this subject uh, in about a week's time when we look at the opium wars, okay? Uh, uh, opium Wars of the 1830s and then the Second Opium War. Uh, what do I mean by the triangular trade between India, China, and Britain? Now around 1700, the company begins to trade with Canton, Guangzhou, importing silk, tea, and porcelain. And incidentally, you've got the same issue here that you had with India, that there are things that the British want from China. There's nothing that China really wants from Britain. Absolutely nothing. And so once again, what's going to be the, what are you going to have to send? You're going to have to send silver, bullion, right? The demand for tea in Britain grows. And, and tea is a real novelty. Uh, and England, for those of you who know the country, you know that, it, that I mean, now coffee has really made big inroads in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, but tea has been the predominant drink uh, uh, in England for a very long period of time now. Um, and when I said the demand for tea grows, by the 1760s, it's estimated that the consumption of tea in Britain was one pound per annum per head. That includes child, a child, per head, one pound of tea, right, which is a considerable amount. Right? By, the light, by the late 1700s, tea is accounting for over 60% of the company's total trade. All right, and from 1758 to six, some 1768 to 73, the company's imports of tea from Guangzhou or Canton increased threefold. 
Now, England is sending, as I've mentioned to you, silver in return for the tea. But there is concern about all the silver leaving Britain. I mean, first the bullion's gone to India, it's now going to you know, China as well. And one of the things that's going to happen, it happens before the conquest to a small extent, it's going to, it's going to accelerate massively after the conquest. Namely, that there was that opium production in Bengal is going to grow immensely. And what Britain is going to do is it's actually going to, instead of sending silver now, once India comes into Britain's hands, is basically going to send opium to China in return for the tea and the silks and the porcelain, tea principally, right? Uh, and in fact, the company actually used to hold what are called uh, opium auctions. So uh, auctions of opium grown on its plantations in Bengal. Uh, and these would be auctioned to the highest bidders, very often to independent foreign traders, in exchange for silver. Now notice what's happening here. So it's actually getting silver from these independent traders, independent traders, uh, and what we're saying is two things. One, that, the op that in place of silver, it's actually sending opium increasingly. The, we haven't got into the political history of the conquest yet, but we're just looking at the economic history over here. Right? That, the op that increasingly from the 1760s onwards, you're going to find that opium is going to be sent uh, to China in place of tea, uh, because this opium is grown on plantations, which now have come under British jurisdiction uh, in India. And secondly, what we're saying is that there's going to be a reverse flow of silver. All right? So in fact, to some extent, Britain is now getting silver in from these independent traders who, have, who are taking part in these opium auctions. Right? Uh, and uh, there's going to be a reverse flow of silver back to Britain. But one of the things that we have to think about, uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about subsequently because it's going to take us into in the 1800s, is that opium addiction in China is going to become a massive problem. Right? So we're talking about over, I mean the estimate is about 10 to 12 million uh, addicts. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Manchu dynasty or the Qing dynasty uh, about the 1730s, uh, moving into the 1760s, 1780s, somewhere around that. Uh, I, I think that the number of addicts in 1730s is much smaller, but moving into the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, we're talking about millions of uh, addicts. Um, so this is essentially the bare bones of that story. All right, we're going to get to we're going to get to as I said the opium wars later on. Now let's revert back to the question of the political history of India, circa 1740s. Who are the actors that we need to think about? The Mughals. All right, the Mughals. Um, and I'm going to say a few words about them because they're not going to be very much in the picture in some ways. In some ways, then we have to think about the Marathas. I'm going to refresh your memory about who they were in just a few moments. I had talked about them in my, one of my previous lectures. And then we have to think about, uh, of course, the British, in particular, a man called Clive. Um, and we're going to think about the Nawabs of Bengal. Okay, the Nawabs of Bengal. And there are going to be some elements of this. Uh, story uh, which are going to be uh, quite uh, strange to you. Uh, for example, you're going to hear about a place called Murshidabad. And don't worry if you've never heard of it. I hadn't heard of it until I became a student of Indian history, really. And I can tell you, most people in India haven't heard of it. Uh, there is a wonderful book by Jeremy Seabrook. Uh, called Song of the Shirt, which is a kind of a majestic, short but majestic history of the politics of uh, the textile industry in Bengal from the 1700s down to the present day, because I don't know how many of you know, the biggest exporter of textiles in the world today is Bangladesh. All right, Bangladesh. All right, uh, you know, w w Eastern Bengal, uh, uh, which, which was part of the Bengal that we're talking about here. I mean, all right. So, uh, but but uh, Seabrook claims uh, that at one point, about the 1750s, Murshidabad accounted for five percent of the world's GDP, not Bengal's GDP, India's GDP, the world's GDP, five percent, and no one's ever heard of this place. 
as I said, unless you're a historian of India, you know, uh, right? So, uh, and, and we'll see what exactly the importance of Murshidabad was. But let's go back, let's start with the Mughals. 1740s, roughly. 1739, what happens? Anyone has any idea, 1739? Nadir Shah invades India, okay? The ruler of Persia. Yeah? I want to tell you a little story. It's, 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 all, it's tragicomic. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I was invited to dinner at a friend's home in LA. This, this friend who invited me is a faculty member at UCLA. He's Iranian. And so, you know, he had a lot of Iranian friends. And so this, one of the people he invited was one of his younger friends who I was introduced to him. And he says, I'd like to apologize to you, Professor Lal. I'd never met this person before. I said, what for? Have we, have we had a conversation in our, you know, at some point, have I forgotten it? And I was sort of like joking. I said, uh, did we know each other in our previous lives or something? Uh, he said, no, 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 you know, you're, you're Indian, right? And he says, I want to apologize to you for Nadir Shah's invasion of India <laughs> in, in 1739. Uh, I was flabbergasted. When I, now, w what was he apologizing for? 1739, Nadir Shah comes to India, he sacks and pillages northern India. You know, the sacking of cities, it's a subject for a lecture in itself. You know, when you sack a city, you reduce it, you pillage it. Uh, I mean, there's another city that always comes to my mind when I think of the sacking of cities, and that's Baghdad. Uh, we saw the, the, the sacking of Baghdad 20 years ago, uh, but uh, the first sacking of Baghdad was 12, 1258 when it was the capital of the, uh, the Abbasid Caliphate, when the Mongols invaded it. And you know, I don't know if you've heard the phrase Black River. They speak of the Black River in Baghdad. And what is meant by that is that, you know, when, when the sacking of Baghdad took place, the Grand Library of Baghdad, the House of Wisdom, uh, was pillaged. Uh, and so many books were thrown into the river. So many books were thrown into the river, it said that the river turned black. Uh, with the ink from the pens in which they had been written, you know, right? Anyhow, it's interesting story. So what happens? 1739, Nadir Shah invades Delhi. Uh, there, uh, the narratives from that time tell us that, you know, that he was merciless. He created, you know, pillars of the heads of the dead, right? Now, why is that important? I mean, I don't, you know, it's not that the gory detail uh, is something that should concern us so much, right? What it indicates is Delhi. What is Delhi? It's the capital of the Mughals. That's the significance. That the Mughal emperor is sitting there on his throne, and this person has, Nadir Shah has invaded northern India, and the Mughals are impotent. If I may use that loaded word, right? right? They're impotent. They're unable to do anything. They're unable to, pre to stop the carnage. So the Mughals had been reduced to a mere shadow of what they were at one point in time. In 1756, just before 1757, the year of the conquest, the, you know, Ahmad Shah Abdali, who is an Afghan, is going to attack Delhi. But there was nothing to pillage now, because the city had already been reduced at that point in time. You know. All right? Um, and in fact, when in 1756, when the second pillage takes place, as it were, I mean, there was really nothing to reduce, as I said, but at that point, the Mughal emperor was a man called uh, Muhammad Shah, uh, nicknamed Muhammad Shah Rangila. Rangila is the colorful one, all right? And why is he called the colorful one? Because he was really a patron of the arts and music and dance, and he wrote poetry. Rulers aren't supposed to do that, right? Uh, and that's what he did. So he was called the colorful one. But again, it's not simply an anecdote, an amusing story. We're, give, we're giving you a portrait of the Mughals. On the one hand, that politically they had been reduced. On the other hand, there is still this efflorescence of art, culture, and music in many ways. All right. So this is the situation of the Mughals, who are still the sovereign power in India in 1756. Let's not forget that. But when I say the sovereign power, uh, now we have to qualify that in some ways because I want you to, to take you back to 
a uh, couple of the slides, I mean, you can basically look at any slide, it doesn't really matter, but uh, if you look at this one, for example, when I say sovereign power, the problem, remember, is this, that there are parts, so there's a, so there's, a, 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 this is a place here, you don't see it on this map, around here is a place called Avad. that's the Nawab of Avad. all right, um, it, it, here you have the Nawab of Bengal, the Nawab of Bengal. Then you have over here, south here, this is the Karnatak, you have the Nawab of Arkot. Right, don't worry about the names. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because even though the Mughal is a sovereign power, these Nawabs, these rulers have, in a sense, broken away. Right? They are, in principle, they are vassals. Vassals or slaves if you want to use that word, feudatories of the Mughal Empire. That is, that they, they actually collect, you know, they have a large number of middlemen, large number of intermediaries that they work with, but they are the collectors of the revenue. So the revenue is going to be collected by various people, it's going to come into the coffers of the Nawab, then the Nawab is supposed to convey the, all right, the, the revenue to the Mughal Emperor's treasury. Right? And same thing with the Nawab of Avad, same thing with the Nawab over here. But in principle, many of these Nawabs have really broken away. Okay? So even though Mughal power is sovereign, there is this qualification you have to think about. The other qualification you have to think about is, let's not forget the Marathas. And I, if you remember, I had mentioned to you the Marathas, right? So this is the area around here where they had originated from. Uh, Western India, Pune, Aurangabad, all of that here, okay, uh, but you recall what I mentioned to you that the Marathas in fact had, had were people who had pioneered guerrilla warfare uh, in India, uh, in fact they were, a, they, they were like the thorn uh, in the emperor's foot all the time, right, um, and in fact uh, it, we, we know that that they were capable of conducting these lightning raids with great effect. So one of the places that they're going, the Marathas are going to really plunder and pillage uh, is Surat over here, which is a port. Uh, and the English, of course, had to contend with them as well. So th th why am I mentioning the Marathas? I'm mentioning the Marathas because uh, the question here is, is, why isn't it that the Marathas were able to offer effective resistance? Okay, because the question that we have to think about it, how is it that the English become the leading power, right? So why didn't the Marathas succeed? Even though the Maratha Empire at one point, if I, sh if I showed you a map of the Maratha Empire at one point, it would extend to this entire region over here. Considerable portions of the Deccan, uh, considerable portions all the way of North India, at least up till the Gangetic Plains over here, right? This is all Maratha territory at one point in time. Uh, you know, they lose some, they gain some. That's what's going to happen over a period of, uh, you know, several decades, all right? Um, and you could say, when we think about, okay, why aren't the Marathas a power here? A, they're really too far away from Bengal. We could say that their, bat their own battles with the Mughals had considerably weakened them, right? We could also say that they were not sufficiently aware of the British threat, much in the way in which the Mughal emperor himself was in some ways not really aware of the British threat. All right? uh, the Marathas were a land power, they are not a maritime power, and maritime power has become really central to the acquisition of authority in India by this point in time. And we're going to find out in just a few moments that when the battle, the, before the Battle of Plassey, there's going to be British troops that are going to go from Madras to Bengal over here. And they're not going to go inland, they're going to go by sea. Right? This is what I mean in part when I speak about maritime power. And the Marathas were not greatly loved. Today they may be, but certainly they were not greatly loved in their own time. Uh, right, uh, because again the feeling was widespread uh, that the Marathas are engaging in you know pillage and plunder, but they're not really creating administration, and that's not really strictly true because of, uh, certainly in Western India we know that they, that they showed enormous uh, gifts in such things as administration. Now let's shift to Bengal. So I've talked about the, the, the we're thinking of the different players here, right? Uh, we're thinking of the Mughals, 
uh, why they're not really uh, going to be a potent force, uh, why the Marathas weren't able to do anything, and we're, we're now trying to suggest what is it that enabled the British to really creep in, if I may use that phrase, right? Now, uh, if we turn to Bengal, all right, so let me just uh, take you to a slide of, uh, these maps are very hard to read, so I want to just show you a, a very modern map, all right? This is Kolkata. This is Kolkata here. Calcutta, mid 1700s, it's now called Kolkata, it used to be called Calcutta, uh, mid 1700s, 1750, it has a population of 100,000, okay? Murshidabad is just around here, it's in the west. So this is the, this is the Hughley, uh, and, and uh, it's a really, if I may put it away, a channel or tributary of the Ganga, all right? Here's the Ganga over here. All right, the, the great river that you know, starts up in the mountains over there in, in the northwest. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about Murshidabad. All right, so Murshidabad, uh, and there is this, uh, if you look at this map over here, you see that right over here, this is it. Okay, it's very hard to tell from this map. It's not a very clear map. I didn't have a high resolution of the map. Um, so Murshidabad is, uh, there's a, a, name, a man by the name of Murshid Khan, Murshid Kuli Khan. He's the one who builds Murshidabad. He annexes Bihar and Orissa. Orissa is eastern India, uh, south of Bengal. Uh, when I say Bengal, by the way, at this point in time, let me clarify what the word means. It doesn't mean what Bengal means today. It doesn't even mean what Bengal meant really in 1947. Today, of course, you know, if you look at a modern day map, you'll see that Eastern Bengal is now an independent country called Bangladesh, which I've already referred to, right? Because Bengal was going to be partitioned in 1947 uh, at the time of the partition of India. Uh, Bengal really was a massive province which included considerable parts uh, of today the state of Bihar, all right? Uh, so we're talking about an extraordinarily large province. It was by far the wealthiest province uh, of the Mughal uh, Empire. And here's another uh, uh, complication. To the British, the Bengal very often meant India. Right? So when, when, a, a, when a British SAS writes something like, on the effeminacy of the inhabitants of Hindustan, we're going to look at that essay later on, right? Uh, Hindustan here meaning India, it, what he really meant was Bengal, because that was the part of India that they would know best. Of course, they knew other parts as well. In fact, down here in, in the south, in the Karnatak, uh, if you recall from my previous discussion over here, you see, if you look at these British settlements, look at the key over here, right? So this cross over here indicates what the British settlements are. And you notice that here is Madras here, which is where the British had built Fort St. George. We know that there are British settlements over here in Surat and Bombay. So it's not that they didn't know other parts of India, but Bengal is the place that is going to be most well known to them. This is where they're going to first impact India as rulers. Uh, and many of the theories that they, that they evolved about the character of the Indians, all right? What are their religious norms, so forth and so on? It was really based on the experience of Bengal over here. And Bengal here would include uh, this entire area, really, okay? That's what we're really talking about. It's a massive, you know, province that we're talking about, all right? So now, um, Murshid Kuli Khan, who establishes Murshidabad, Right, which you don't see on this map because it didn't even exist really at that point in time. Right, uh, uh, he uh, uh, becomes a nawab of uh, nawab of Murshidabad in 1716. All right, uh, and uh, Murshidabad was the capital of Bengal, not Calcutta. Calcutta is not going to be the capital until the British take over. In fact, actually, uh, even after the conquest. Uh, you know, Murshidabad remained central for, for about 15 years, then Warren Hastings, um, you don't have to worry about this chronology, by the way, these, some of these details, but uh, Warren Hastings, who's going to become the first governor general of India, he's going to actually move the courts to Calcutta in 1772, and then as, he's going to move them back to Murshidabad in 1775. Just gives you an indication of the importance uh, of this area. Now, the Nawab, 
uh, has a, a man called the he works with this money lender if I may put use that word the money lender is an important figure uh, in this story all banker as well uh, it is well established that virtually all the British in India were indebted to Indian money lenders by the way all right because they all overspent they all overspent uh, uh, on l having lavish houses and servants, consorting with Indian women, holding parties, you know, so forth and so on, right? Uh, the notch dance, you know, you, you hire a number of women who dance for you, that sort of thing, right? They overspent and they borrowed money from Indian money lenders, right? Uh, now, uh, the Nawab of Murshidabad uh, works with a man called the Jagat Seth. Okay, this is actually a title. Literally, it means banker to the world. There's no modesty here either. I mean, these, these people know who they are, right? And Murshidabad was exceedingly important, right? Uh, he has a name too, the, the actual Jagat Seth, the, but this is the Jagat Seth is like an office, it's an institution, all right? Um, it was Murshidabad was the most important center. All right, production center, trade center for raw silk and silk textiles, um, which were important commodities, not only cottons, silk as well, uh, from Bengal in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, it's interesting that when Clive, and we're going to get to Clive in a few moments, when Clive, who is the conqueror of India, that when he mis visited Murshidabad for the first time after the Battle of Plassey in 1757, he wrote with utter surprise that, quote, the city of Murshidabad is as extensive, populous, and rich as the city of London. With this difference, that there are individuals in the first, that is in Murshidabad, possessing infinitely greater wealth than the whole of Lombard Street which was a financial hub of London. So single individuals who possess greater wealth than all of Lombard Street. This is Clive's own assessment, all right? right? Um, and what's also interesting is that Murshidabad, Murshidabad was a place that was in fact actually exceedingly cosmopolitan. Now when I say it's established, I'm talking about Murshidabad on the Nawabi times because there's a much earlier history. For example, there, it had been a pilgrimage center for Jains. All right, uh, some of you don't know who the Jains are. The Jains are, uh, Jainism is a, is a religion um, which uh, developed, uh, you know, it's, it has a long history, but it's mainly associated with this part of the country in Gujarat. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi, whom we're going to encounter in weeks 9 and 10, uh, grew up in this milieu uh, where Jainism was very important. And the Jains are, are uh, what they're most well known for is that they're not, they're not only strict vegetarians, uh, but the whole principle of ahimsa, nonviolence, um, is central uh, to, to Jainism. All right. Now, the, now Murshidabad, so, and, and the fact that, that here, Murshidabad over here, that this was an important Jain uh, uh, center of pilgrimage shows you that the Jains themselves had moved around extensively and Jainism had spread to various parts. All right. Why do I mention this? Because we're saying that, in fact, Murshidabad was in many ways a highly diverse place in religious terms extremely ecumenical right we know that there are settlements of the of the dutch <coughs> the portuguese the armenians fascinating history of armenians in india all right uh, but armenians dutch portuguese french all of these people had settlements in Murshidabad, all right? Um, and if you look at the architecture of Murshidabad, what you see is a kind of a, a uh, composite, you know, uh, mix of styles, all right? So we're talking about a place that was an en enormous economic center. It was highly cosmopolitan, all right? Uh, and uh, and uh, there was a considerable European presence. It was religiously ecumenical. Uh, and there is a great deal of testimony which, which suggests 
that we should think of Murshidabad as a place of considerable splendor and magnificence. Now, of course, we can't make any inference from any of that about what class relations were. Uh, I'm not saying that it was a model of economic equality. I'm making no argument of that kind. But what I am saying is that this is an important place, an important hub. Okay. So this is a situation that we are speaking about, right? That, that Murshidabad is important here. Uh, uh, th think about the fact that the Mughals are no longer really a major player. Uh, the Marathas, uh, re I've suggested to you, I've anticipated myself because I haven't gotten to what's happening here in 1750s yet, right? But the Marathas really are no long, are, cannot be a force over here. And the last thing we have to turn to here is the Karnatak, very complicated history, which I'm not going to attempt to get into because it'll get us into a lot of detail, which, which we don't really need. What is important here is that you have I don't know how many of you know uh, from your you know, f vague recollection of European history uh, what is called the War of Austrian Succession, all right, in which uh, a great many European powers were involved. Uh, and one thing I want to suggest to you, um, think of it this way, all right, just so that you have a modern day analog. Uh, you know, during the Cold War, um, uh, between obviously the USSR, the Soviet Union, uh, and, and the United States and the res uh, respective allies, what do we find? We find that many wars around the world can be understood as manifestations of the Cold War, right? So when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1980, what did the United States do? It supported the rebels, the Mujahideen, right? The enormous money was pumped into, and of course some people have pointed out, that's the rise of the Taliban and this and forth, so forth and so on. You know, there's always a Frankenstein monster that you can create, right? Uh, without knowing it. Uh, now, but what's, what's important here is that you have to understand what's happening there as a manifestation of the Cold War. That there's a war between, so it's really the USSR, the Soviet Union and the Americans fighting it out, but not fighting it out directly, right? And they're proxy troops. If you, and in a way, this is how you need to look at something like the war of the Austrian succession, because it was fought not just in Europe, it was fought in North America. And it was fought in South India, in the Karnatak, between the French principally and the British, all right? Between the French and the British. And the net result of that, without getting into all the nitty gritty details, uh, the two things that are important there. One is that we're gonna find that Madras is actually going to, you know, Madras had been captured by the French, okay? Who are led by a man called Duplay. Uh, uh, and Duplay was a real force at that point in time. So he's a commander. The, you know, the French had a trading company as well. So I've talked about the English, East India Company, of course, that's what we've been talking about. I've mentioned the Dutch East India Company. There was also a French East India Company established somewhere around 1656, somewhere around that time. Um, and so uh, uh, what's happening here is, and the French had kind of, if I may put it this way, nationalized their, the French East India Company uh, around 1720. Duplay is going to be the person who's going to represent uh, the French state because they've nationalized the company effectively, right? Uh, and, and he is going to, uh, going to be a, uh, a, a considerable force down here in, in South India here, Arcot, um, this region over here. Uh, and this is where the first Karnatak war is going to be fought. So Madras is going to be lost by the British to the French. But when the war of Austrian succession ends in Europe, there's a treaty that is signed and then Madras is going to be returned to the British. Okay, right. So this, this sort of thing is going on. However, the real key thing that, we, that, that is important, I mentioned two. One, this is where Robert Clive is going to acquire his first experience. And I'll, uh, all right, he's going to acquire his first experience uh, of uh, military warfare in India. And secondly, the first Karnatak war here between the British and the French is going to show very clearly to the Indian rulers around that and those who can hear what's happening, so to speak, elsewhere, that at this point in time, at this point in time, the British and French, and in other words, European armies, have a military edge. 
that they have a superior military technology. Uh, their, their use of artillery was far more advanced than it was in the case of Indian armies. All right. So, th so, th so one, the emergence of Clive over here, okay, and secondly, what this first Carnatic War really shows to other Indian rulers. Okay. Now, so who is Clive? And moving into the history of Bengal in the 1740s, directly. All right. So Clive is uh, a young man who first came to India in 1743. All right. And then a few years later, he's going he's gonna to join the military service. Not everyone who came and worked for the company obviously worked for the military service of the company, right? There were some who did and the others who worked in, in, in the commercial uh, posts, right? But he, he's going to eventually join the military service of the East India Company. Uh, he's going to, to some extent, distinguish himself. Uh, I don't want to make too much of, uh, of Clive over here in this respect, but the important thing is he acquires military experience. And he returns to England in 1753, uh, quite a wealthy man. When he returns to England in 1753, uh, when I say wealthy man, this is relative because you're going to hear about the wealth he's going to acquire after the conquest. Right? But he's going to return to England in 1753. He's going to attempt to do what I had suggested to you in a previous lecture. Many Englishmen in his place also attempted to do. That is that they were going to try to use their newly acquired wealth to gain a foothold for themselves, not just economically, but politically. Try to buy a seat in the House of Commons. Now he's going to acquire a great deal of political enemies, partially because he's a little ostentatious in the display of his wealth. You know, the English have this thing, if you don't have old money, it's not real money. Right? So he's going to, he's going to uh, uh, you know, uh, provoke some people. Um, and in a way, he's eager to leave for India again. He's going to get the chance to do that in 1756. So before we return to him, let's go back now to 1740s and 1750s in Bengal. So the Nawab there in, uh, is, uh, in the 1740s is a man called Ali Wardi Khan. Um, and I should say, I mentioned this in passing, but I should point out once again for those of you who are starting to get worried about all these names, yes, you know, you do need to know who Clive is. Uh, and you do need to know who uh, Siraj Udola is going to be. But don't worry about, you know, details such as Ali Wardi Khan. I mean, you're, I already mentioned to you, this is a good time to remind you that you're only going to get essay questions. Okay, and you're not going to get IDs, you know, who's Ali Wardi Khan, you know, two points for that, no. Um, and, you know, the, your exams are open book exams, so don't worry about the detail when you get it. I'm trying to keep it actually down to a minimum because we could add enormous amounts more. Uh, now, Ali Wardi Khan has, is a usurper. Uh, he's usurped the throne of Bengal. Uh, and uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, in, in the 1740s, around the time that I'm talking about, prices uh, had begun to rise for a number of reasons. There were some shortages. Uh, it was partially the effect uh, of uh, the fact uh, that uh, there had been uh, intermittent warfare. Uh, you remember that we're talking about constant tensions, all right, uh, not just here, but elsewhere as well. Now, main thing is this that we have to really think about, okay? That he is going to be succeeded uh, in the 1750s by a man called Siraj Daula, okay? Family member. However, a number of things have happened before 1756. Number one, the British have, uh, recall what I mentioned to you about here. That the, that the war in the Karnataka had certainly showed that the British, that the Europeans in general had a superior, had an edge, military edge, mili edge in terms of military technology, uh, organization of the armies, all right? Now, uh, in Bengal, the British had strengthened their fortifications. You recall that these warehouses, initially there were warehouses, right? called factories, but they were really warehouses. And then in order to protect uh, 
these factories, uh, the British had actually built forts. And then eventually, these forts, which are really enclaves initially, all right? I'm going to try to show you. I was in, I was in what's called Fort St. George um, just a few months ago. So next time, I'm going to try to remember to show you some slides uh, of, the, of the buildings from that period. All right. Uh, what we're saying here is that they have eventually added things like artillery to these fortifications. They've added big guns. All right. Now, uh, you, the Nawab works with this man called the Jagat Seth, right? Who's sort of the banker and all these money lenders. And there is some opposition to the Jagat Seth as well, because he has a kind of a monopoly, if I may put it this way. So there is some internal dissension. And one of the things that the Nawabs uh, were unable to do was that political opponents of the Nawab would often get shelter where, you think? In the fort, in the British fort. Right? Where, in a sense, their jurisdiction did not extend. Right? So the Nawab's, Nawab's political and economic opponents, if I may put it this way, right? they're taking shelter in the fort. And they're worried that this British fort is actually becoming the locus of resistance you know, to them. All right? So this, this kind of tension that we're talking about. Now, Siraj ud is the, here, let me, uh, OK. So he is the, he is the a young, when, when he uh, um, ascends to the throne, he's in his 20s, a young man, all right? Very young man. And he ascends to the throne in 1756. The, that, that is, he becomes a Nawab of Bengal. And when he becomes a Nawab of Bengal, he is going to make three demands of the British. All right, very briefly. Right? As I said, you know, we can get into enormous detail here. Right? What are the three demands that he's going to make? One, he's going to argue that the concessions that had been given. I don't know how many of you recall, 1717, I had mentioned in my previous lecture, the Mughal emperor at that time had given these concessions to the company. Right? And as a consequence of these concessions, for example, the British were spared from paying duties right, to the Mughal emperor. What Siraj Dola is going to say is that the British had act, have actually taken advantage of these concessions in various ways. That, not, that it's one thing for them to get the concession, then it's another thing for them to actually parcel out these concessions to others and get, in fact, revenues from them. Right? This is the claim that the Nawab is making here. And I should say at the outset that one of the difficulties of studying this period is we don't have any Indian sources. We don't really have any Indian sources. So the sources that we have, I mean, when I say in Indian sources, I mean contemporary to that time, right? All right. So we have to really rely upon official accounts, official British accounts, what British writers are saying. And you're going to have to judge for yourself how you want to assess. Because what you're going to hear, be hearing now about how the British actually acquire their empire is, uh, you know, a bit of an uh, ugly story. Right? Uh, as Jawaharlal Nehru said, it leaves a kind of an unsavory, bitter taste in your mouth when you think about exactly what was happening here in 1756, 57, 58, uh, those years over here. All right? So this is the first demand that the, that the British, in fact, actually has concessions which are not legitimate, and they're, and they're actually making illegitimate use of these concessions. So he wants that to stop. He wants the dissidents, that is, those who are opposed to the Nawab, who, who have been given refuge by the British and there in, okay, in the fort over there, uh, he wants these dissidents turned over to him. All right? And thirdly, he demands that the British remove certain kinds of fortifications, for example, artillery, big guns from these forts. All right? 
The British refuse to yield to these demands. There are negotiations that take place. Uh, and what does, what does uh, Siraj Udola do? He marches to Calcutta, all right, and takes Fort William. Okay, this is in June of 1756, all right. He takes Fort William, which is in Calcutta, right? Uh, recall that Calcutta was not the seat of empire though, right? I mean the seat of the, the Bengal Nawabs, they, they're based in Murshidabad, all right? So that's why he marches from there, from Murshidabad to Calcutta, and takes Fort William in 1756. He has a much larger army, of course, than the company did. Now, in order to get this back, what they're going to do, the British, so Clive has come back to India. He's going to come back to India. Uh, he's actually gone to Madras, and from Madras, he's going to actually sail, okay, uh, to Bengal. Uh, and this is, this is, you know, following Siraj Dola's uh, taking over Fort William in, in June 1756. And this is where we now get one of the more interesting and problematic episodes that take place. It is said that when the Nawab took over uh, uh, Fort William, that he took captive uh, somewhere between 120 to 150 uh, English men, okay, and women. Uh, some people have given an exact number. Uh, and he puts these, so the number that some people agree upon is 146. So I have a little, I have a website called Manas where I have a little article you know, I mentioned this in the syllabus as well. You, it's a website where you can read quite a lot of articles that I've written on the history of British India. So I mentioned the figure of 146. Uh, the gist of the matter is that apparently, I uh, note the word apparently, th they are confined to a very small room which is about 18 feet by 14 feet uh, wide uh, and they suffocate and then the next morning when the door is open, uh, 123 of them have died. Now this incident is called the black hole of Calcutta. The black hole of Calcutta. And I want to pause for several minutes to discuss how we're going to approach something of this kind. Uh, why is it even important? Uh, it's important because of course um, and here I'm quoting from a biography written of uh, Clive by Mark uh, Benz-Jones in 1974. And this is what he says of Siraj Dola. He says that he has been depicted in history, quote, as a monster of vice, cruelty, and depravity. Right? Why? Because he locked up these innocent Englishmen and women in this room. They suffocate there. There's no air. And the next morning you know, 123 or whatever the exact number is, are dead, right? So he says that Siraj Udola has been depicted as a monster of vice, cruelty, and depravity. But though he may have suffered, I want you to just listen attentively to the words. But though he may have suffered from the demoralizing effects of too much wealth and power at too early an age. Remember that he was in his early 20s. So, you know, when you have too much power and wealth in your early 20s, it has demoralizing effects. I wonder if anyone has argued that apropos of Mark Zuckerberg, who became a billionaire when he was about 20, uh, or, or Larry Page, uh, one of the two co-founders of Google, who also became a billionaire in his uh, 20s, right? So these are all young men uh, with enormous wealth and power, uh, right? Think of it, right? So, but though he may have suffered from the demoralizing effects of too much wealth and power at too early an age, he was in fact no more cruel than most 18th century Eastern despots. Huh? He's saying, you know, Siraj Dola, I mean, after all, their dime a dozen really, you know, because in, in the East you get Eastern despots. That's what you get. He's no, no more cruel, right? He's no more cruel than any of the others. Why do we depict him as this monster, right, who locked up these Englishmen and women, all right? His main fault was weakness, which caused him to be fickle and indecisive. He was also arrogant, of changeable temper, and lacking in courage. 
Uh, that would seem to describe quite a few people, including many in politics today. Uh, but nonetheless, this is his assessment, right? All right. So now, uh, why is the black hole so important? First, there is one account which dates to that period. Okay. Now, I want you to think about what I'm saying. I, I'm not making the argument that the black hole of Calcutta didn't take place. I don't know if it took place or not. And I think for those of you who have this, who may have this conception that history is about finding the truth, well, actually, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I think, I think that that's about as remotely uh, uh, possible uh, as anything else I can think of, particularly when you look at something like this. All right. So who is that account by? It's an account by a man called Holwell, who says he was there. He was one of those who was imprisoned, John Holwell. Um, he actually writes a book um, uh, published the year after uh, the conquest. This is 1756, 1757, the conquest. 1758 is when John Holwell writes a book. This is what the book is called, quote, a genuine narrative. Why do you have to add the word genuine? Let's think about it, right? Um, because if you're offering a narrative, it ought to be genuine. That seems to be belaboring the obvious, right? A genuine narrative, this is the exact title, of the deplorable deaths of the English gentlemen and others who were suffocated in the black hole. Now, no room for doubt here. This is what the narrative is about, all right? So, so Holwell says this is what happened. So let's call Holwell A, because I'm now giving, describing to you a theoretical argument about how a certain kind of discourse comes into shape. So let's say Holwell, we're just simply going to call him individual A. What happens in 1759? Someone comes along, we'll call that person B, and B says that this is what happened in the black hole of Calcutta. And what is my source for that? My source for that is, what's the source? A. And then six months later, individual C, historian C or commentator C comes along. Now, here's a question for you. What does C say? What, are, what, what, does, what does C say are the source? Yes? A and, B, A and B. A and B. That's it. And then D comes along. And what does D say? ABC. My sources are A plus B plus C. Okay? And then, of course, E comes along, and so forth and so on. I hope you get the idea. Right? You, we have one purported source. I don't, I, I'm not making a claim either way about the authenticity of this source. All right? But we have one source. We have one source, and what's going to happen? The great rational Western mind, as we've been told in India, is going to say 10 years later that there are 100 sources. Right? And you, they just keep on repeating. This is what happened, by the way, weapons of mass destruction. This is exactly what happened. You know, coal and power, remember, you know, I mentioned, show, you know, here, here, here's my UN presentation, I'm doing it. This is the evidence, and the next day, 10,000 people are going to repeat it, and then, of course, three months later, a million people have repeated it, and then you say, well, we can actually go to war, because Iraq is something called weapons of mass destruction. Right? This is, by the way, if you had to think of it, this is also what is called iteration, iteration repetition. When you say something often enough, and you have the power behind what you say often, it actually can create a certain truth of its own. Right? And this is, this is the warning that Ronald Inden, I'm putting it in a, is his language now, had issued in the piece that he had written, which I had shared with you, which I had asked you to read, where he said that, you know, social science discourse is manifestly based on this presumption that there is reality out there. And then the knower, that is me or whoever it is, it's going to map that reality and it's going to make it knowable. 
But here we are not talking about necessarily a reality that was out there. And again, I'm being an agnostic about it, right? Because I'm not claiming that I have a better account of what actually happened or if it happened at all. But what I'm saying is that all that is really available to us, in a sense, is to understand how a certain discourse came into shape about what happened in the black hole of Calcutta. What was the nature of this man called Siraj Dola, right? And let's just look very briefly at, let's say, uh, what are the attributes of Clive that we can think about, okay? Um, but before we do that, it's important to mention the outcome of all of this because after the black hole, so we're going to find that then Clive is going to be accompanied by a man called Admiral Watson, right? And they're going to arrive there um, and they are going to be able to take back the fort. Now this is going to set the stage for a, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't take questions. I know that a couple of people because I have to really make sure I keep up with the narrative here. All right. Uh, but next class, definitely before I begin. So. 1757, the set stage is now going to be set for this battle, uh, as it's called, which is going to be a battle between, between uh, Siraj ud uh, and the forces of the company. However, the matter is extremely complicated. Number one, the battle was won before it was fought. Let me explain. Siraj ud the British are going to come to an agreement with a member of his family, with his uncle, Mir Jafar. Okay, so if you look at the major actors over here, I pointed that out over here. Okay, Siraj Dola, this is the Nawab that with Clive we've already encountered. Mir Jafar, that's his uncle, and that's another relative of the family, Mir Qasim. We'll get to him in a moment. They're going to come to terms with Mir Jafar before the battle. And the terms are that we are going to install you as a Nawab if you're willing to betray Siraj Dola. Okay? And this agreement is, is worked out between them. Uh, when the forces of the company meet with the forces of Siraj Dola, Siraj Dola doesn't know this. Uh, the forces are lopsided, by the way. Uh, the Nawab of Bengal had. Uh, it is uh, estimated, if I remember correctly, around 50,000 soldiers. Um, the East India Company had 800 British soldiers, uh, the army of the East India Company in Bengal, and they had 2,000 sepoys. So Indian soldiers are called sepoys, okay, from the word sepai, okay, uh, in Hindi. So sepoys they're called. Uh, so they have 2,000. But before, when, at the time of the battle, m these sepoys are going to flee. Most of them are going to throw down their weapons. They're not actually going to fight. The whole thing lasts about three or four hours at most. I mean, the word battle is kind of, you know, dignifies what was really a skirmish at best. Uh, it's not even clear it was really much of a skirmish, you know. Uh, Siraj Dola is going to be found dead in a gutter a few days later. In the meantime, Mir Jafar is going to be installed as the Nawab of Bengal. All right, um, and uh, there are interesting questions here, such as, well, to what extent were Indians really aware of what they were doing? Really aware in the sense that, you know, had they thought of the implications? Was this just okay? Another, you know, another battle where you know you decide to take sides, one faction or the other, and accept whatever outcome there is. Of course, you know, no one at that point could have said what the outcome in the long run would be of 1757, of the Battle of Plassey, as it's called. It's fought at a place which anglicized name is Plassey. Okay? Um, and uh, the, the Clive is going to uh, profit immensely from this. The company will as well. Uh, 234,000 pounds is a figure that I've seen. Some people say 200,000, but the agreed figure is a minimum of 200,000 pounds is what, what uh, uh, Clive is going to uh, acquire personally. Uh, he's also going to uh, be given rights to certain land, so he becomes a jagirdar, he becomes a landlord. Okay, he becomes a landlord, he's going to get certain tracts of land. All right, uh, the Nawab, 
uh, we're going to get back to Amir Jafar for a moment because the Nawab is going to have to relinquish certain territories as well. But let me just continue the narrative with Clive for a moment and then we can get back to the question of the Nawab of Bengal. All right. So Clive is going to um, uh, hang around for a while there and then he's going to, re he's going to go back to Britain. Uh, and uh, if we had the luxury of spending a whole lecture on Clive, because he's an interesting enough character in some ways that we might want to do that, uh, but he's he's going to he's going to uh, be actually put on trial uh, much later on in 1772 uh, on charges of corruption, okay, uh, for of having acquired illegal wealth in India, so forth and so on. Uh, and in 1774, he's going to commit suicide. But the most interesting moment, to my mind, uh, is uh, what happens during this inquiry committee in 1772. All right. Before I mention that, let me just give you the estimate of an, a great English historian of the 19th century, whom you're going to read in a different context because he worked in India, uh, Thomas McCulley, uh, also known as Lord McCulley. Right? And so McCulley's opinion was that he said, he thought, incidentally, so you're going to read one of his other essays uh, this week, and then you have another short essay by him on something else in, uh, in a subsequent week. Uh, he said that Bengalis were fitted by nature and habit for foreign yoke, right? That they're meant to be enslaved. This is, these are McCulley's exact words. And he says of Clive that in other parts of his life, he was an honorable English gentleman and soldier, but he was no sooner matched against an Indian intriguer, that is Siraj Daula, than he himself became an Indian intriguer. Right? Do you, you understand what he's saying? That, you know, Englishmen are absolutely honorable. The, but the problem is when you put them in the company of corrupt Indians, intriguers, they become corrupt. They become corrupt, right? That he himself became an Indian intriguer and descended without scruple, to falsehood, to hypocritical caresses, to the substitution of documents, that he forged documents, and to the counterfeiting of hands. And yet, Macaulay says of Clive, this is his estimation, after having told you that he's a forger, deceiter, all of that, right? Uh, he says, he gave, quote, peace, security, prosperity, and such liberty as the case allowed to millions of Indians who for centuries had been the prey of oppression. Now notice, you don't have to demonstrate, right? See, this is where that discourse has come into shape. There's despotism in India. In India, people for centuries has, have been living as the prey of oppression, right? This is just assumed. This just becomes part of the normal explanatory framework, right? who for centuries had been the prey of oppression, while Napoleon's career of conquest was inspired only by personal ambitions and the absolutism he established. So he's saying in comparison to Napoleon, Clive was much greater because Napoleon was actually only fueled by personal ambitions. Clive had something much bigger in mind. He wanted to establish an empire for the British in India. So that's the prelude to the committee inquiry in 1772 when Clive is now back in He's been back in England. He's been, he's been honored. He is now Baron of Plassey. He's been given a title, right? All of that. Um, extremely wealthy. And so when he's put on trial, the most amazing moment comes when after the charges have been read out and he's been interrogated and all of that. And Clive says that, look, I want to explain to you all what the situation was. In 1757, you know, when I defeated the Nawab, the treasury of Bengal was opened up to me. You know, he says, I was escorted into the Nawab's treasury and I had to walk over jewels and rubies and diamonds. There is, by the way, a Hollywood film called Clive of India, made in 1935. A little hard to find. It actually has this it captures this scene, right? All right. So he says, you know, the country was at my feet. The wealth that I could have had was extraordinary. And this is 
the most amazing line. And he says, and yet you have charged me. How unjust. Quote, and I quote, by God, Mr. Chairman, at this moment, I stand astonished at my own moderation. These are the exact words. I stand astonished at my own moderation. I mean, you, you, you just have to think of the fact I could have raped the country. I could have acquired millions and millions. I just took a mere 200,000 pounds. You know, why are you whining about it? Right? <laughs> right? Again, reminds me of someone else. Right? Why are you whining about it? Right? That, I mean, this is, these are the exact words from the parliamentary trial of Robert Clive. All right? Let's go back now to the conquest and the plunder. Because I've already given you a sign, indications of the plunder. Of course, a company is going to gain enormous wealth to the comp because the Nawab is going to transfer over some of the uh, um, portions of his territory, uh, the revenue effectively, especially to the what is called the 24 Parganas. That's, those are the regions below Calcutta. Uh, let me just return to the map here uh, just so that you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so well, so this portion over here, this doesn't actually mark it, but this portion over here, this would be what are called the. These are the northern twenty-four parganas. This is the southern. So the the, the revenue of all of this uh, is going to be actually transferred over to the East India Company. All right, and think of it this way. Already, right? They've started to use opium, but only to a small extent at this point in time, right? In place of bullion. Right? It's going to increase dramatically opium production. But the other thing that they are now going to use is they're going to use these revenues in place of bullion. Right? They've got another source now. Right? Right? So, so these are the immediate consequences that the company is going to acquire partial sovereignty at this point in time. Uh, in 1757-58, partial sovereignty. Well, sovereignty is actually too extended a word because it's going to be a few more years, but they're going to acquire basically the rights to the revenue of certain districts over there. Uh, this revenue is going to be used in place of uh, bullion, um, and they have become a, a political force. All right, um, and then this is where we get the treacherous part. So. Mir Jafar has now been installed in place of the Nawab. However, Mir Jafar is going to be deposed by the British. He's going to be thrown out. And in, in his turn, they're going to put Mir Qasim, who in turn, you can, now I have to skip over because I could get all the details. Mir Qasim in turn is going to de be deposed in 1763, and Mir Jafar is going to be restored back. So it's, it's musical chairs, if you want to put it this way, right? You know, you take out one man, put another one, then you take out that man, put the other guy back in again. W why are they doing it? They're playing off these people against each other. Uh, they're also doing it, of course, because each of these Nawabs uh, realizes that, look, I mean, the British are just constantly squeezing us now. Their, their demands are becoming excessive. All right, and, they, and you know, this points to some degree, you could say, to the integrity of the Nawabs themselves. They're worried about the fact that basically, uh, Indians themselves are being left out of everything that's been happening over here. Who's acquiring all of this revenue and the profits and so forth and so on? Right, giving it to you in the short form, in the short form, because there are excessive demands that are going to be placed by the company. So you're going to have this juggling going around. And I'm going to just end with 1764 here, which is what's called the Battle of Buxar. Um, this is the key battle after 1757, where Mir Qasim, right? Who, is, uh, who has been deposed uh, and Mir Jafar has been put back, he is going to ally himself with the Mughal emperor who's sitting in Delhi, okay, and the Nawab of Awadh, right, who is in the Gangetic Plains. Right? The three of them are going to join hands together and they're going to, have, they're going to uh, fight a battle with the forces of the East India Company. It's called the Battle of Buxar, uh, which they are going to lose. All right. 
And you could say that at that point in time, the foundations for British rule in India become secure, at least in Bengal. So we'll pick up the narrative from there, um, uh, move on to the 17, you know, to the aftermath of that, uh, uh, and then move on to Warren Hastings and the administration of India.